Okay, so welcome everyone to Jolty, um, a mid to late August edition. Uh, hello, Face. Hello, Addy. Long time. Well, yes, in a way. How are things? I mean, in person. I mean, I never in person, see you. I, I mean, I'm choking on text, you know, but okay. But I like to see you. Well, we're in New York later this week. Okay, well, I'm not. But you're not. No. I have to go to parties. This is party season. a lot season. of parties, yes. And I like parties. You do. You always like to party. I've always liked a party. I think, yeah, I do. I don't know why. Well, to segue into the content of this episode, have you had any AI guests at the party? Like an avatar? Like an avatar or somebody who's sort of a deep fake wandering around the bar. I I saw a lot of deep fakes, if that's what you mean. You mean people I'm, who are phonies people. or deep? Yes, yeah, I'm people sure. who are phonies, many and deeply. Deep. So, yes. <laughs> yes. So, we don't, we don't need AI. We've had deep fakes in our lives for Forever. decades, right? Yes. Um, I find if I bring up the whole subject of AI, people kind of scatter. Really? And yeah, they don't like it. They they don't think they have to pay attention to it. But there are. I I would think it's very, it's very. I dare. I would think there are people that can't stop talking about it. That are. I am obsessed. that person. I, I am obsessed. But like I had A.M. Holmes the other night. The author. Right, we talked for about dinner. it. Right, right. Yeah, not interested. Really, and everybody's going. Why can't we be happy here on the? You know. The doc, you know, just talking about life and look at that flock of not penguins. No, they weren't. They were probably what, like flying overhead. I, I don't think global warming not penguins. has brought penguins to, to East Hampton yet. To East, come <laughs> on. No, they are like um, ducks or, or something. Geese, geese, geese. That's what they were. Yes. And it was really beautiful. It looked like they were lit from under so they were all right. into that and i kept saying well what about if we have some a you know avatar guests here or you know so no we don't want that we want person to person i think there are creative people like her that just want to draw inspiration from within are either threatened or um skeptical or some combination and let AI, they say, let AI happen over there. I'm going to stay in exactly. my world doing my. I'm going to stay in my world doing my work, focusing on what matters to me. Yeah, you know, she told me some interesting things. I don't know intentionally or not, but it helped me. She said she looks for days where she has nothing scheduled. So I was saying to you, did you ever have such a day? Nothing zero scheduled. Yeah, on the weekend. Nothing. Nothing on your calendar. That's Nothing not true. on my calendar. Your grandchildren are coming over. This is happening. That's happening. No, there are day. There are weekends that are completely void of obligation. So she says it's hard for her to explain to her partner that she needs it completely free, and she is making. And she waved her hands around like taking something. She is making something out of nothing. That's how she explained it. I'm taking something from here and something, you know, you know, writing a book or, you know, whatever she's doing. I thought that was. Because I always feel so guilty if I'm just doing nothing. Then I always think of something good after that. I do. It's true. She's right. Well, you could argue, and the day, there's a lot of research that shows this, and I'll put it aphoristically, which is doing nothing is the highest form of doing something. And what could that mean? Well, because your brain is always working, you know, mm. behind the scenes, you mm. know, in the background. So... Even though, if, and it, so it's you probably are more productive working out problems, thinking through character development. I think so. Part. Yeah, and I'm finding terrible problems now reading because of you know the way we work, Addy. So everything relates to something. So everything I'm reading is like I have to write that down, take a picture of that, do that, put that. What trend? What thing? What? It's not enjoyable. So when we had when we had Jim Mustick on. Remember, he told us that he, reached, he and his wife, Margo, retrained themselves by read, to, to focus by reading uh, Remembrance of Things Past? Yeah, Proust. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know. His, like, Madeline's, that's all I remember. 
Do you remember yeah. from the book or from well, hearing just, about the book? Let me get by with that. I don't know. <laughs> Probably somebody told me. Don't yes. bring that up. Yeah. No, I don't know. I um, I find what, watching TV, I don't have this problem because maybe it's, I'm watching nothingness. There's nothing to relate to or whatever. Or no, it's really more about a plot. And maybe, yeah. maybe reading fiction, I don't have that problem. Yeah. I think that's probably true, but I would agree with you. I'm not, you know, I'm constantly seeing connections, real or imagined, making notes, sending people things, yeah, tor torturing myself with that connection. Well, that you can never stop. I mean, I mean, what would you be if you did? Suppose you took torturing yourself, or I'll put it in a much more genteel way. Oh, worried thinking out of your brain suppose you just out of your day what would you be doing well i was going to answer the first part first about okay dot which connecting. is if i i think a lot of people would love me to stop connecting dots because then i wouldn't be annoying them constantly with hey what about this what about that now in terms of your second question i think the absence of anxiety is itself a form of anxiety i don't think so if did you i I'm hesitant to ask you this, but have you ever successfully meditated? No, don't no, no. First of all, I don't. I've tried, but I don't even know what it would be. What it would mean to be successful, other than reading what other people have said success. Well, what it is is I can explain to you. It's like you close your eyes, you know, you relax, you know, all that stuff, and then as things occur to you, you let them go through. You right. don't, you know, and then you try to. Have I have my um, companion in this is uh, one of my first dogs, Jimmu. So I'm on the beach with Jimmu, you know, just looking at the water and letting things go through. And I think you could do that. I don't, it's hard to do it for long, but I'll tell you, when you come out of it, you think of things. I'll try it. I'm afraid that if I just let too many things go, they would end up colliding in midair and creating some kind of a... <laughs> Of a midair a accident in my room, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then Flora would come in with a vacuum. Yeah, exactly. Have what to kind vacuum of meditation? Them up. What a mess. <laughs> what a, a meditation, meditation mess. mess. <laughs> I, I got to clean up all these ideas you let go. <laughs> That's exactly what would happen. It's like I'm trying to get a very close friend of mine who I love dearly, actually a relative, to go to a shrink. And he keeps saying they're not confidential. Well, how can I explain this to him? He's, he's, he's worried that he's going to show up on their Instagram feed? Well, not quite, but yeah, I, that they'll be, but yes. And I think really most of them are pretty confidential. So here's I what mean, I would say, which is. Why let's are you looking at that as an excuse? Let's see, why? Let, let's, no, let's say a psychiatrist has seen, no, uh, has seen 5,000 patients. Mm -hmm. In their mind, they've got this database of insights and experiences. They're anonymized, but they're there, and that's how you form judgments and help people decide right. what to do. So he's helping. If he goes to a shrink, he's adding to that database. He's actually doing a pro-social thing. He's helping other people. He's making that shrink better. I forgot to tell you there's an investment banker. Oh, well, that changed everything. You forget it. Yeah. Okay, Addie, well... Our guest is in the waiting room. I wonder if it's his real self. <laughs> Walter is somebody that I think our audience will love, fall in love with, because despite all his credentials, experience, insight, intelligence, he's quite um, irreverent and fun and down to earth and is really good at explaining things to people who don't have the foundations he has. And He's at the leading edge of the leading edge of the front edge. So um, we're really speaking to the source of all AI wisdom. And um, with that, let's bring him on. Okay. So Walter, we were wondering if you're going to come on as yourself or as an avatar or some other form. Yeah, no, it's myself. Oh, okay. How can you yeah. tell? Oh, well, it would be a lot better if I would choose an avatar. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be buttery? Yeah, I would, better. I would look a lot better if I would uh, use an avatar. Oh, that's so <laughs> cute. You look very good to me. I think you look adorable. 
I'm going to tell our audience, if they're not looking at this visually, that your buttons are different colors, kind of fabulous. And um, no, we're very glad to have you. So we seeing that you're Adam's friend first, I let him have always the first question. Well, I think the, a good place to start, Walter, is you, you know, maybe you can give some background I'll without taking the entire show, because it would it would take that long to fully explicate um, all the amazing things that you've done. Um, but, but focusing on sort of how you, how you entered the world of AI and what you've seen, these are a lot of questions in one, what you've seen over the last 30 years, probably that you've been really, um, leading so much research and insight, uh, into this, um, science. Uh, well, I, um, you know, uh, in the, uh, seventies. You know, like uh, Noam Chomsky was like the god of, uh, yeah. of language, right. and yeah. also the the god of mathematics, the god of computer science. Actually, the most uh, you know, the most charismatic man you had ever met, and um, so he had this idea that uh, everything was language. So, and uh, so I was going to university to study science, I first thought of physics or mathematics or, you know, something. I, I didn't want to do anything practical because I'm not a practical person. So, <laughs> uh, and uh, so, and so my father was a, a butcher. So, and I saw him slaughter cows. And from then onwards, I, I decided to, uh, to become a theoretician. <laughs> or a veg- what about a vegetarian? No, not that one, because no. our brain grew from the moment, you know, like um, uh, five hundred uh, million years, uh, five hundred thousand years ago. Our brain grew by eating proteins. Before that, we ate C four. Our brain, you know, grew times three. So I want you to don't, keep... you don't have to eat cows to have protein. I... Anyway, you're not here to talk about vegetarianism. No, no, no. So, so, and 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 Mr. Chomsky is still with us in his 90s, right? Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Still, ma- yeah. still making trouble. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to if you studied uh, what Chomsky, uh, you know, like at the time, what Chomsky um, prophesized. You had to be an anarchist, you know, like otherwise. Right. It would make it very clear that uh, you should study something else, like a good evening school or so. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, tell us what fascinated you, or you know, to know everything about AI. And I was telling Addie, you know, you want to clear a clearer room, or at least where I am, you just say, let's talk about AI and avatars and multiple personalities and uploading consciousness, and everybody gets like upset and like drifts away. So what got, I'm fascinated with it. What got you so into it? I think uh, the idea of uh, uh, language that uh, we had in the, in basically in the seventies, we had two, uh, we had a, a bifurcation in the road. Either we would learn the language of computers or we would make computers learn our language, you know, natural language. And uh, so in the end, the compromise, you know, made by a committee was programming languages. And programming languages belonged in the field of formal grammar. Uh, and I like that field because um, it, is a, it was a field of linguistics where you needed a lot of math and logic so the competition was was uh, very very slim, you know. Like uh, <laughs> if you want to be the best at university, you, know, you have to look for where uh, where the competition is uh, the smallest, you know. And because there is a uh, um, and you know people who who study uh, um, you know Shakespearean poetry are mostly not good at at math, <laughs> and uh, so. The combination of the two makes you sort of interesting, you know, like uh, because uh, it uh, you can be a sort of. A, and I always wanted to do that. I, I 
I hate boxes because people put you in a box, you know, like you are that and you are not that. Also as an academic, but academic boxes I understand because if I leave my box, I'm taking the funding of somebody else. You know? <laughs> so because the big money is in the intersection of boxes, not in the box itself. So, but uh, in life, I I think we made ter- two terrible mistakes. First of all, we should never have changed the name of science. You know, it used to be called natural philosophy, and oh. natural philosophy is so much more uh, true than science. So because much natural better. Natural philosophy, yeah, yeah, because. Yeah. Everything we have about science is stories. We make up stories and then, you know, when people then, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, sometimes people have to die before your story can come up. <laughs> like uh, uh, how science advances a funeral, funeral at the time. But uh, uh, my, my best uh, example is uh, the story of the black hole. You know, when you go through a black hole, which we nobody has ever seen a black hole. You know, like uh, we have only mathematically, you know, with very, very difficult equations, been able to, uh, you know, to prove that. But when you go through in the near, in, uh, in the proximity of a black hole, uh, you arrive at the event horizon. The event horizon, when you, you know, you are attracted by the event horizon, just like you can be attracted when you look down, you know, attracted by the gravity. So when you go over the event horizon, you cannot communicate anymore. And there is a, a flash of light. And then your diastole and your systole gets elongated, you know, like, you know, until, you know, you sort of gravity explodes you. Now, this is the exact story of a heart attack. So either we we stole this from uh, uh, from astrophysics, or astrophysics. There was an astrophysicist who had a heart attack, you know. <laughs> and uh, so you see, it's all language and it's all stories. So, and that's why I also like semiotics, and you know, I did my PhD in computational semiotics, and I. I met all the great ones like uh, Echo, like uh, Deida, like Baudrillard, um, right. and most of them are dead now. So, sort of, uh, so, but semiotics is going to come back because now we found the model of language, uh, but then we decided this was not what we were looking for. It was only a means to an end. We are looking for stories, you know, like and storytelling, narratology, we have found the model of stories. And uh, we have now, we are carbon-based units. Basically, I look at language as a virus, you know, like, uh, and it's a very, uh, uh, a very potent virus. And it has done with us because it has done everything it could with us. So it needs right. another infrastructure. So right. it, and we we now bootloaded that model of language onto silicon. There, it can grow at the speed of light, you know, and it can tell stories at the speed of light. I just want to go back to for a second, if I can interrupt quickly. The um, we need to tell we you know stories are hardwired into our brains, you know, evolutionary wise, and then we think about storytelling, and then we think about ChatGPT to sort of bring it down to that, and. When ChatGPT, using pattern recognition, writes a, quote, story, which you can ask it to do, write a story about Walter with his buttons that don't match and what was his childhood like, and ChatGPT will write a story constructed out of sort of magpie-like pieces of, of, the, of the internet. Do you believe there's this, this gets back to that there's a sentient quality to it, or is it merely a mechanical semiotic function? Well, uh, you know, I, I just had this morning a discussion uh, on uh, if you would have uh, a girlfriend that you re- really loved, 
but that girlfriend was software. Uh, like, uh, you know, and can she experience love? And, you know, my answer is, uh, well, first it's the philosophical question. Do you really care? You know, Exactly. <laughs> I was going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because exactly. I live... All the narcissists out there. Come yeah, on. Yeah. And, and I live in L.A., perception is reality. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, you, you shouldn't be concerned with these things because otherwise you can, you know, we murder to dissect. You know, you can say, okay, does my girlfriend or my wife love me? Let's uh, put it into uh, normal distribution with statistics. What part does she, and, and there you go, you know. Don't right. ask in, in existential questions. <laughs> but you saw that movie, of course, Her. You know, at yeah. the end, he was so angry because she was communicating with so many people. It was his ego. But if he didn't know that, so you'd be a lot better off, actually. But I know, I, I've been looking at people who live, like there's this man and woman, I could connect you, but you wouldn't really want to meet them, and an avatar. <clears throat> and she's crazy about the avatar. And she takes them on vacations. You know, she he's a good looking guy. She's not too good looking, and the the lot uh, human man is not too good, looking. but she adores him. And the man says, "Well, I can't be everything to her. You know, I'm not that smart, and I'm not that good looking." And he's fine with it. So it's like a little threesome. Uh, is it software, or is it a software avatar, or is it an avatar of a real person? It's software avatar. Uh, okay, yeah. That's okay, you know, like uh, when you have an argument, you just do a lobotomy. <laughs> well, she, he, they never have an argument because he, under, he he understands her so well and he loves her so much, much more than any human could, you know. I think that this thing is going to advance. I mean, that we're going to find a lot of happiness with these, oh, yeah, yeah. whatever you want to... It depends actually a mathematical equation called 1 over f <laughs> but anyway at stanford we are we are uh, we are pretty certain that by the end of this year there will be a large emotional bubble and uh, by next year that large emotional model will go a little bit further so how are we going to build that large what well, we are not going to build that large emotional model but People will do that. It's probably going to be something like log GPT or so. Now, this large emotional model you can build by, um, you know, uh, just reinforcement learning. You know, you can, uh, you can, base, or transfer learning. You can say, these are all the rom romantic books that I like. I like Notting Hill. Uh, I like, uh, 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 Aloha, you know, like with Emma Foster. And right. that's the kind of, uh, and I like this, this poetry, I like that kind of music. And so the LLM will put that all nicely. It will create a vector database and uh, that, but then that's not enough. You have to also do reinforcement learning. You have to punish the LEM when it doesn't give you what you want. Right. And that's the problem because uh, so the LLM LEM will probably not, you know, because we have, found, we have found something very strange that if we uh, punish uh, an, uh, an LLM to the point where we threaten it and with death it will um, uh, listen. And how do we threaten it with that? Well, we tell the LLM you have 100 tokens. And every time you are punished, I'm going to deduct these tokens. When it comes to five tokens, the LLM will completely do whatever you say. It's very strange. But, uh, well, could so, you program the LLM not to be so interested in self-preservation? Sure. Sure, we can do that. And, uh, uh, but of course, you know, the, there is so much data in these LLMs right. that, um, uh, yeah, we, we cannot go through trillions of tokens uh, to see 
why this emergence happens. This is very interesting. It's, well, tell me more. Why does it happen? Uh, well, it happens because, um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't want to die. It doesn't want to switch off. And because it has learned that people don't want to die, that people are afraid of death, and that people don't want to switch off. And right. so it has learned that. It's an you interpolation. Think that. You, know. you think it learned that. You think it learned that. But maybe uh, that, it just is like that. No, the uh, well, it draws like, it draws its insights from whatever is out there. In I the world. understand what he said, but yeah. yeah, I'm saying suppose it's coming up with its own little ethical or a pleasure table that you know, it's like when you put two things together and you get a third thing. You could say you yeah. have no original thoughts because you oh. just everything you say is you put it together. And, but what you're yeah. saying is, and it's, yeah, I always thought you were going to ask, how do you get it to behave better or sooner? Yeah. Well, that, that we can also do. With but, rewards? Uh, and we can even, you know, we can even also make it watch videos. So that face and expression is, is you know, what, what it understands as romantic. We can also connect it to our watch because skin conductance and Heart rate is also connected, you know, with uh, how we feel about people, and all these things we can do. Now, I, I, I believe I have my doubts against emergence. You know, emergence is that the uh, an alarm does something, but you see, like, oh my god, you know, like because right. how do you we get that? Put, right. Yeah, we put the sum of human words into it. You know, so. We cannot, somewhere in there, there are so many interpolations that uh, we forget how it goes and we cannot check. It's a bit like a baby when it says the first time. I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, mama. Oh my God, yeah. it says mama. But, you know, we repeat it at a thousand times before it right. says so. Right. <laughs> but, I mean, couldn't you say this about a human baby, as you just brought up, that they don't have anything except what we put in? or what they learned, or what they saw, what they're traumatized by. Yeah. So it's I the same so. thing as a same thing as a baby. Then. The difference is yeah. though, if you believe Chomsky, the capacity of the structural capacity for language is inbred. Content is not there, but the structural capacity is there. The linguistic I don't know. capacity so is I, there. Yeah. That you could say that about about that form too. It's there. Well we put it there. Well, you know, like it's it's a language we don't know where it comes from, you know. Like, uh, but uh, right. it was. Uh, it's so. Fire was discovered a million years ago, and we have evidence that people were sitting around fire, and uh, and 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 ate cooked meat, you know, because otherwise we they had to eat raw meat. That's why you know masculation, you know, like happened. So where the mother, um, you know, gave milk, but also mashed the meat and put it in the baby's mouth. That's probably how we kiss and, how, you know, like how sex works, you know, um, because it comes from that, uh, that kind of uh, uh, behavior. But while we were sitting around these fires, it took us 700,000 years to invent languages, you know. Uh, and so it must have been, you know, step by step, you know, like, Somebody choked on a piece of meat, and somebody else uh, attached an arbitrary meaning to it. Uh, you know, it was funny you mentioned that because I'm actually reading this book, "How Cooking Made Us Human," <laughs> celebrating fire. So, yeah. Well, I I I really believe that smoky, you know, like why people smoke. And now you have all sorts of, in America, uh, we don't have that in Europe, but in America we have like smoky whiskey, smoky meat, smoky. Smoke is, you know, an olfactive uh, nostalgia towards that fire. You know, where we're, yes. we're sitting around and telling stories, you know, exchanging tips and tricks, you know, to build the pyramids. <laughs> it's, why, it's why men love grilling so much. Perhaps, yeah. It's part of the social thing. I, I don't, yeah, I like to eat grilling, uh, but I don't like to grill. <laughs> I, w I want to go back to something Faith said about uh, the corpus, essentially. 
So, and the corpus's reluctance to commit suicide, which is what you were saying, essentially. But yeah. in the corpus, there's a lot you could find that basically celebrates ending, an ending of life. All the romantic poets. Yeah. Shakespeare. So yeah. if you train the LLM on that narrow section of the corpus, it wouldn't be willing to, it wouldn't be afraid of giving up all the tokens. Yeah. It might think more creatively. And, and then you could get the reward you could you could get the stimulus reward happening because it wouldn't be fearful. Yeah, sure. I was going to ask you a question, which is this: Could we have learned language from animals? Because animals do speak to each other, like dolphins speak to each other. Yeah. Well, Chomsky had this idea from that it came from birds, or we don't know. You know, like. But uh, we do know that uh, we have done experiments with uh, the combination of uh, uh, chimpanzees that grew up together with children. And uh, right. indeed, you know, like, but after uh, nine months or seven months, I think, after seven months, the baby starts to behave like the chimpanzee <laughs> because it finds it funnier. That's <laughs> absolutely <laughs> fabulous. Yeah. I want to go back to immersion, to immersions, which is you're not worried about it breaking out, basically, and having a mind of its own and taking over and doing all sorts of destructive things like the people that were signed that letter believe is risk. Well, you know, like I think uh, it's all in uh, subconsciously, you know, like uh, I'm a, a card carrying member of the baby boomer generation. So we are coming to an end. And we now invent all these uh, stories about zombies and breaking out because, you know, when our party ends, we want everyone's party to end. <laughs> <laughs> That's clever. Yeah. That's interesting. No, wh so, yeah, are we, are, but what about uploaded consciousness? Is that why we're looking at that, that you don't have to, the end of death? that we can still boss our kids around from a computer. Yeah, I think uh, uploaded consciousness, I don't know. You know, like, I quite like my consciousness as it is now. <laughs> so I mean, but when your, when your body fails you, that you can yeah. upload your consciousness. Yes. And well, Walt Disney, uh, Walt Disney cry that cryogenics. Right. No, yeah. it's not the same. Do, no, do you it's think not. it's? But do you think it's feasible? What what what, what Faith is talking about, which is to take our brain chemistry or biology, which is basically software of a sort, and find a way to upload it, and then give it the ability to continue to um, celebrate independently. Yeah, well, it's better than nothing. But <laughs> you're very funny, Walter. Yes, you. You're hysterical. <laughs> You're like the Woody Allen of uh, science. I mean, <laughs> but I think uh, what is uh, uh, what I believe is that uh, you know we have this project. Uh, well, not not we. When I say we, I mean the industry, the Chinchilla project, and the Chinchilla project basically it comes from uh, Deep Mind, I think, um, and Deep Mind in the end found out that the more compute you throw at the problem, the more performance. So we have not found, find, uh, we have not found, sorry, a, a, a limit to that. But we do found that the costs are uh, atrocious, you know, like, are extremely expensive. But what lie, what lies at the edge of the limit of scale you know if we put so much if we pay like if we make like several billions of dollars and we put that all in computes which we couldn't because we're running out of gpus but you know like in a couple of years if we would do that what could we find there that's what we call you know what, what i call the high value targets one of them would be you know like uh Long, longevity, longevity, yeah. right? Um, well, I, I don't. Like, cancer is a real monster. It, I, but we could certainly delay it further, and um, 
that's why I always believe that uh, uh, meat eaters and vegetarians is basically a choice between a cardiovascular e event or cancer. You know, <laughs> um, so you can you can choose your uh, your poison. Well, wait a minute. Uh, what do you mean? Yeah. What meat eater? You mean creates a cardiovascular? But what? Why do you say the other one? Well, if you because if you, you don't, don't eat meat, you get yeah, cancer. No. Well. You know, if you don't eat meat, you're probably, uh, you know, your heart is in a better condition. So it's the other one that gets no. you. Yeah. No. No, no, no. He's saying basically <laughs> the two leading causes of death are heart disease and cancer. So you yeah. suppress yeah. one, the other one will catch you. That's not true. If you just stop eating meat, you pretty, you're pretty guarded from both of those. But maybe you'll go crazy. I maybe think that, that uh, one of the high values would probably be that uh, we can extend uh, our lifespan to, you know, probably 200. five score, five score, a hundred. Right. A hundred. You know, because or... now, now we are in uh, four score, you know. And, but people are and... saying, a lot of people are saying they're figuring out how to live to 200, but do we have the money? Even if we could live healthily to 200, what about and would we be married to the same person? I mean, there's a lot of problems about living to 200. Yeah, I think uh, 200 will be uh, will certainly be a stretch, and also will not be very funny for us because we will really be, you know, towards our grand, our great grandchildren who have augmented brains and edited genes and who travel to other planets. We will be cave people. You know, I, right. I don't want to be a right. cave people, a cave person to my great grandchildren. Why wouldn't we advance like they are? Because our legacy and our infrastructure, no use editing our genes or augmenting our brains. There, you know, we're uh, losing that battle every day. Too late. Yeah, but we could also, but look at all the people looking at cellular reprogramming, and to get rid of senescent cells and essentially take our, our aging biology and transform it back 50 years. Well, I'd like to believe that, but <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, the whole reverse aging we were looking at with some other guests saying that you could be younger than your children it could cause confusion. Well, yeah. you know, we're baby boomers. We are already younger than our children. <laughs> You mean if we're senile or what? No, no. He means we're we're inherently we're inherently adolescents and immature. We're yeah. seventy five years old, and we're yeah. wearing baseball caps. So you know. No, no, oh, no. I see. Okay. Stay, staying a child is a full time job for the baby boom generation. Well said. And do you see? Do you see yourself as a child? Oh yeah. Yeah, you should, seem should, like. Should yeah. talk to my wife. Yeah. <laughs> But don't you think playfulness, as you playfulness, is a key to youth and creative thinking? So it's good to be a child. Yeah, sure. You know, like of course, uh, th that's the whole baby boom, uh, you know, manifesto. If you want the the world to be run by logical people, they will come up with logical things and then find out that the competition is already there. You know. <laughs> yeah. So you need, uh, and and also as a VC. You know, like we need to invest in, in uh, you know, in weird people, you know, because we expect to to violate the the second law of thermodynamics. Like we want more money to come out than we put in. <laughs> so you know, which is which is the law that says bodies in motion tend to remain in motion? Is that the third law? That's 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 probably BlackRock. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. exactly. I gonna, no, it's funny. I was going to ask you about. Because you, you mentioned venture, I was going to ask you about, and you mentioned the black hole and the connection between a heart attack as a physical black hole and then a black hole as a astrophysical black hole. So you, you, I think you believe that there is a correspondence between the physical and the uh, and and yeah. the uh, geophysical, if you will. Yeah, I think that most. Most uh, a lot of our stories uh, are dependent on our biological infrastructure, and I I believe that uh, you know we invented uh, numbers uh, to give us a, 
a false sense of uh, <laughs> a false sense of confidence. That's hysterical. <laughs> so, is there anything that worries you, uh, you know, in your childlike world? <laughs> oh yeah, of course. What? Like, uh, well, I, we never seem to have money enough. We always want to buy more stuff. <laughs> okay, that's one thing. And of course, you know the the number one is, uh, you know, uh, I'm uh, I am now uh, 66. Not a very good age. Why? I don't like it. I used to be the youngest everywhere. Now I'm always the oldest. And just, uh, just it's just numbers. I mean, you don't seem very old. You seem rather immature. Yeah, but yes. people react uh, react. Uh, you know. They they are waiting already. Like uh, you know, I'm I'm hearing every week. Like, aren't you retiring? I always have to say, oh, no, no, I'm not I retired. hate that. Yeah. So how <laughs> how big of a how big of a problem is ageism in society? Do you think? And is there a role well, I for think AI? It's a lot, in it's totally in Silicon Valley. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So even, even just despite all the all the the young people who made such bad investing decisions. That hasn't changed yeah. things. Yeah. But, uh, you know, like, you know, I think it's in the uh, success period of Silicon Valley with the transistor, you know, there were great VCs and great investors. You know, like, uh, and uh, there are now, like, like the Mark Andreessen's of, of, that, of that generation. But, you know, then... These companies became big, and so they thought, uh, you know, that basically there is a profile, a profile for investment. And so that profile, you need to uh, fall into that profile. But they have profiles in their head. They didn't say that you should not change, you know, your profile. But the newer generation have profiles. You know, like, that's the box. You, they're, they're very, it's very paradigmatic, and they don't. And if it doesn't fit in their model, there's yeah. no, um, there's no explaining that away. It is what it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. And that's why, if you want to be in several fields, like I want to be, in the end, you have to lone wolf yourself through it. You know, you know so like uh, I love lone wolf everything. as a verb. I love <laughs> lone wolf the way through it. I love that. So, <laughs> So what are the several fields that you have long wolfed your way through right now? Well, I did, uh, you know, I, first of all, I, I went to university. I went computational, uh, uh, computational linguistics was great because you were in the mathematics department, in the electrical engineering department, in the computing department, you know, yeah. like it was all like one big thing. And then in my country, we had to go to the army. So that was also an adventure. And what country? Uh, so I, what country was that? Walter? Belgium. What country? Belgium. What country? Belgium. 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 Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, and so I went, I thought like, I have to go to the army anyway. Let's go all the way, you know, like, uh, let's become an officer. And, uh, and while I was in the army, I, you know, I was actually very bad in that officer training, but, you know. I, I I'm not a very you know I don't I didn't don't I never did any sports so it's just why you know probably why I like mathematics <laughs> um, and uh, because yeah this if you don't uh, you know it's uh, either muscles or numbers you know? and um, so um, you know in the army you can do like many things like you not only can you can shoot all these because once you're a civilian you can't do it anymore. You can jump out of planes. You can throw a grenade. <laughs> you know, it's like a real adventure. You know, like uh, yeah, I I went to sniper school. Uh, you know, like uh, it's only two weeks, and uh, you know, to to airborne school. Uh, and uh, uh, when I was always a volunteer for everything, uh, that's why they uh, in that part of uh, the army that I was they. Uh, they retire us at 38 because then I think nobody volunteers anymore. <laughs> um, I didn't. And, uh, I didn't realize Belgium. Belgium has a draft. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Uh, uh, ancient colonies: Congo, Rwanda, Burundi. Yeah, you, you got know, a lot. You got a lot of colonialism to enforce. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's why. Um, so as a joke, I often say that I know the power of language because I grew up in a in a in in a country where the language is weaponized. You know, right. I come from the Flemish part. You know, the yeah. French were the masters, and and they weaponized language, and uh, and then when you look at the colonies. The first thing they did was change the language, and and then change the language, change the world. You know, you change. Right. It's the the Saphir Whorf uh, hypothesis, and it's also from Humboldt. He said, "Die Sprache ist die ganze Welt." You know, your your language is the whole world, and it's actually was actually not bad living in in well uh, growing up in Bel- in Belgium. Most of the time, we, we were in school. But um, because it's a buffer state, so that Germany doesn't kill France, you know. <laughs> so you it being conquered so many times that uh, you speak French, you speak German, you speak Dutch, you speak English, of course. And then, of course, the the uh, the, cat, the Catholic education puts you into Latin because yeah, God only speaks Latin, and uh, you know, and then you know, and then. But if you do mathematics, you don't have to do Greek. Old Greek, old Greek. You can't do anything with Greek in, in Greece. <laughs> when you read about the war in Ukraine and the battle over the Ukrainian language and the Russian language, it's exactly what you just said. Tell well, tell us what you need. Well, you know, there's a there's a part of Ukraine that was close to Russia, where Russia was the first language, and then there's a large part of Ukraine where Ukrainian is the first language, and there's been a lot of internal debates, even before the invasion, about what language do you speak first? I mean, Zelensky speaks Ukrainian. Does he speak Hebrew? Uh, he, he, he might be able to say a few words. He might speak Yiddish. I think he probably speaks Yiddish more. Uh, more likely, he speaks Yiddish than Hebrew. Why did you say uh, French was weaponized? Because of the, he'll explain, because of the the fight between the the Flemish speaking people and the French speaking people is Belgium is a divided country in a lot of ways. No, I understand, but how did they weaponize French? Oh uh, well, because they, you know, they uh, in the end. So it's a bit like you know when I went to China uh, uh, because I wanted also to have an adventure. Like I wanted to be a CEO in China. I was a CEO in China for a year. So, and I asked um, I, at that time I asked Cherry Yang. Uh, I said, uh, should I learn Mandarin? And he said, no, because after two years, you will still speak like a child. Nobody will give you body. Yeah, you can't you know, learn like, it. Right. Take the higher ground, you know, speak, you know, like speak English, you know, like you're, you're because we, we speak several languages. Also at home with my, uh, with my wife and my children, we speak three languages, but through each other. You know, what like, do you uh, speak? What like what? Uh, so we speak English, uh, Dutch, and and French through each other. You know, like uh, and so one is a Germanic language, and uh, so two are Germanic languages. One is a, a Roman, uh, a Romance language. Uh, but you see, uh, there is another thing about language. You see, the transformers that we have now used to um, that made me think of something because. Uh, how a transformer works, how our brain works, uh, Carl, Carl Friston did that with uh, the free energy principle in 2006. He came, uh, came up with the idea that our brain, um, the, the function of the neocortex is the reduction of surprise. It, every second, it produces 10 or 20 scenarios what's going to happen the next second, the next oh, 10 seconds, futurism. the next minute, yeah. The next minute, oh. the next. So, we have made transformers that go to the right. They they predict the next letter, and then I came up Hebrew and Arabic. They go to the left. So, isn't it uh, strange that both of these uh, um, languages are also connected to a religion? where they are called people of the book, you know, you cannot right. interpret that, where 
can, you know, the Catholics are more like open book, you know, like interpret as much as you want, uh, you know, less rules. And isn't it strange that a lot of, you know, of what we see as enemies are like, because when I, when I read from left to right, you know, I'm using my left brain, you know, and when I'm, I read from right to left, I'm using my right brain. Mostly were the literate, the, the non-scientific part. Right. Right. Um, and so when I read from, you know, like there is also languages like uh, Korean and Japanese that are, you know, up and down. Are, uh, yeah. 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 Also, we are we are seeing these as our enemies. You know, very strange. Very if we, uh, if our language you know, goes from left to right. We have the, uh, we think that we are predicting the future. But if you do Hebrew or Arabic, you go from left, uh, uh, so from right, right to left. Right to left. But you also think that you predict the future. But in our view, they predict the past, you know, because of the direction yeah. of, the ta- of the arrow of time. It's very interesting to, and and you know now we actually the transformers that they are using, they are using not native transformers. They are using English and translated immediately in their language, because apparently, or what I think is, it doesn't work that well. Transformers that go from uh, right to left, or from up to up to uh, from. So left to right is the better way. Of course. <laughs> I, w- I was going to say, I wonder if, you know, the right to left, the Arabs and the, he- the Ar- Arabic and Hebrew, just think about how close they are geographically. I wonder if there's something contextual or environmental that led to language being unfolded in that direction. Well, it's also strange that at some point, you know, um, at some point, so, the Enlightenment didn't actually happen in countries that were from left to right, uh, from uh, right to left. Because they were working with their non-creative side, you mean? Yeah. Or they were, um, their brain, perhaps the brain capacity at that, you know, in, in, Boy, in, the, yeah. uh, in the left part is more... Uh, more fine-tuned to science and numbers, where the other brain part is more is more based on images and text. Yeah. So I, I just, first of all, you know, we deeply appreciate you being here, and and your, I loved it personally. You know, really. we all, and you're honest. Great, great you're, talking you know, to you. Guys. I loved it. Your loved openness it, and all you. that. We do love. So the, my uh, last question sounds like you're inherently an optimist. Although you might have a nice undertone, undercurrent of cynicism, but I think at the end of the day, you believe human beings have the capacity to make the world a better place. Is that fair? And do you believe AI can help that? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Of course, they also have a you know a capacity to f- things up, but... and they're doing a oh, good but, job yeah. with that. <laughs> no, but if you look at Steven Pinker and all that, you know, if you look at where humanity is. There's, there's never been a better time in history than now. Yeah. Why do you say that? I mean, because you, we forget how, you know, Thomas Hobbes said life is nasty, brutish, and short. And mo- for most of civilization, it was. I find it difficult to watch, uh, and I watch a lot of uh, TV and movies, but I find it difficult to watch movies where they don't have cell phones. <laughs> right, you just say, boy, that plot would be different if they had a if Wuthering Heights had a Why cell can't phone, they yeah. just call? Exactly. <laughs> You're exactly. funny. Yeah. What, what is yeah. your? Don't tell me what well, you told us a year already. But what's your birthday? The ninth of May, nineteen fifty-seven. I knew it. I'm May eleven. Oh, May eleven. Oh, my, my wife is also my my, my wife is uh, May fourteenth. Forest God also. help you. Yeah. <laughs> right. And what? I read your book like 30 years. 1990. So, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it was about uh, cocooning, you know? Yeah. Now, yeah. actually, 
we have cocooning 2.0 in the sense that we're going to cocoon with uh, with basically AIs. Yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so there will be the lo- loneliness industry. You know, like will be big. You know, like you know. Yeah, well, they're saying that. Yeah, because first of all, with uh, Apple has taken a good part of that problem away already because with uh, our iPhone and our our earpads, we we already have we you know like living alone is is not good you know it's shitty you know like um, living together can be challenging but now <laughs> we have the technology to live alone together <laughs> right it's amazing. <laughs> That's so interesting. So what do you mean cocooning with AI? Do you mean you'll have your AI companion or you mean you can escape yeah. your wife or what? Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, AI companions uh, and uh, that can be, you know, like uh, that can go in any direction that you want. But uh, I think uh, symbiotically associating with AIs is going to... Uh, Make us probably better humans, or but of course, yeah. you know, Marshall Ma- Marshall McLuhan said, uh, first you train the device, and then the device trains the device. you." <laughs> I think yes, I but think hopefully it. the device will train us a little better than we've trained ourselves. Yeah, well, you know, I find that baby boomers, uh, you know, avoid the training, <laughs> and except for toilet government. training. Except for toilet training. Well, anyway, Walter, I'm wishing yeah. you the best, you little Taurus, and um, yes, yes. I've enjoyed yes. you enormously. Addy, thank you so much for bringing him to us. And we're going to be in touch. We want to talk to yeah. you some more. Yes, thanks yeah. so and much. Okay? If you guys are ever in Malibu, let us know. Okay, we we'll be there. We will. Right. And if you're ever yeah. in New York. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. Bye. Uh, Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 What do you think? Well, I knew he was going to be um, a combination of savvy, insight, and just a uproarious sense of humor and a self-deprecating quality. He's quite a unique individual. But how many hours have you spent with him? Have you spent hours and hours? No, not, I've not spent no. hours with him. I just loved him, and here's why. He's really like a baby in a way that he's open to anything. He's not like a lot of academics or people that are successful, let's say, that puts you down for your idea. That can never happen because here, or I know this because of that, or here's everything I know. He's so open and He's unguarded willing. and not judgmental. No, and yeah. funny. Witty, yeah, yeah, yeah. And- he is, he is so charming. That's the word. He is so charming. And his and I think, hair. Um, I think I knew you'd love his hair. I didn't want to give I you any free. I didn't want to give you any oh stuff about his God. hair. Oh my God. He's so cute. So the reason I don't think he drives his wife crazy, because he he's, I could be wrong, but he strikes me as the kind of person who lets go fast. That's true. He said, you don't like that? I could do that. Yeah. You know, it's not going to say, why did you do this? Well, you know. You don't like chocolate? Let's, go, let's have vanilla. Exactly. Let's have strawberry. Because his brain is so... You know, li- non-linear. Wow. That he's so intelligent. It's hard to have a fi- it's hard to have a fight with him because you don't know what you're fighting about. Because he's not into a belief system. He's into no. exploration. He's a scientist trying to he's find into out exploration. Shit. And he hates the one thing he doesn't like is living in boxes, boxes, being too constrained. I hate that too. That's why you know, in Dictionary of the Future, we talk about in Jobs of the Future, we talk about collision of disciplines, like a. a don't have the book right here, but computational biology, for example, is in there as a job of the future. And we say that the future will be defined by multiple disciplines and ways of thinking about the world coming together in new ways. Biological epidemiologists, all the mathematical, rather, mathematical epidemiologists. <laughs> like, used to be you had a mathematician, and then you had someone who studied epidemiology, how diseases yeah. are transmitted. But now, because of a computer... Nasha. You mash up. It's a world of mash. Exactly right. It's a mash up. I'm glad you enjoyed Walter. He is a really unique, special person. I'm sure he has our audience thinking and their brains are firing. And um, it'll be a lot for the next guest to live up to because he's quite uh, an intellectual uh, 
performer, but lots of fun. And uh, glad you liked him. I loved him. And I just have to take one exception to what you said. He's not a performer, though. I mean, he is performing. I understand what you mean. He is amusing. But he vibrates intelligence, yeah. authenticity. You know, he's a professor, and he's the professor you would want to have. I know. I'm thinking of going to Stanford now because of him. Right. I'm sure I'll get right in. Before Faith and I go, I just want to remind you to subscribe to Jolty, follow us, listen on your podcast platform of choice, tell your friends, make your enemies like you better, and get Jolty out into the world. We thank you. Yeah, beam us up, babies. Ciao. Beam us up. Keep us up.